Uh, yeah, I've never used them. Okay, cool. Um, so yeah, my name is Diego Padilla Garcia, and I'm a second year graduate student in the psychological and brain sciences department. And uh, so far, I've been TAing classes such as uh, res advanced research methods and design, behavioral neuroscience, biopsychology, and right now I'm TAing for systems neuroscience. And one of the uh, struggles I found among students that's kind of common in these types of courses, uh, I'd like to highlight it first by asking you all a question. Um, if I, there we go. So what do you all think of when you hear organic chemistry? Um, I remember as an undergrad, I was a pre-med, and this course, I needed to take it. And it's a bottleneck course, first of all, for my degree, or was a bottleneck course for my degree. Uh, if you didn't pass it, you couldn't you know, take your upper divisions in biology. Um, it's also known as a weeding out course, so if you didn't do so well, you probably shouldn't go to medical school. Uh, it was also just known to be generally a hard class. So, but I actually had no idea what the content was going to look like. So already from the get-go is an uphill battle, um, and that's kind of an issue. In fact, uh, it's, at least on my campus, even the grad students would be wearing a shirt that had this joke on it about OCHEM. Uh, that OCHEM is just so hard that you're dying, and uh, yeah, <laughs> and that's just what the the bonds are called. It's dying, so it's like a play on words. Um, but for this slide, <laughs> for this slide, I was trying to find like an illustration of like a really frustrated student um, trying to study for OCHEM, just to kind of put that up there. And I actually came across a blogger talking about OCHEM, and OCHEM to me as an undergrad. It was after I took it, it became my favorite course of all time. I loved it so much to this day. I still love it, and I remember a lot of it. And, uh, and I'm not a chemist. So she was talking about coping with hard courses. And then that just kind of inspired me to like, think about that, the way she was approaching OCHEM. And I was realizing, you know, why are you calling it so hard? It's not like a, a matter of how hard it is or what it is. You're already setting up this uphill battle. So I'm just here to say, Keep calm, it's only organic chemistry. It's not impossible chemistry. Um, and that's just one side of what I'd like to talk to you about is just this is the label or the identity we're giving to classes such as OCHEM. Um, but also, we, I also like to think about who am I talking to? Who are the students? They bring in their own identities and they come from very different back backgrounds. Um, so there on that side, given this diversity of uh, backgrounds, we, have, we all have our different you know, weaknesses and strengths and, and and those types of things. Um, but I'd like to talk to you a little bit about some research done on, in social psychology on kind of the way identities may be interacting with education. And this is uh, dominantly I'll be talking about stereotype threat. And this is just the fear of confirming a negative stereotype of one's own group. Um, so in education, we see how it impacts uh, potential people at risk of this, such that it does a lot of negative impacts. It can lead to students students de-identifying with the institute, which um, decreases motivation. You see these students not using the resources of the university as much, such as learning centers or office hours. Um, other studies have shown how it decreases performance, such that it actually impacts working memory. So as you're sitting there, you may be thinking, oh, if I do poor on this test, you know, people are going to really say, like, for example, I'll, I'll use myself as an example. I, um, I'm a Latino, and we are natively portrayed in many ways, and one of them could be in education. And so I could be saying to myself, if I do poorly, people, I'm only further confirming the stereotype that Latinos are not good in science. And that, in turn, is a, it's tying up resources in my head, which I could be using towards the test that other people may not be exhibiting. Um, so to kind of address these two issues, you know, the label applied to OCHEM to begin with, and then you know, what people are bringing in, and, and specifically identities that may be under threat, um, I like to, my approach to, to, to addressing these issues is I like to get them really comfortable with the most fundamental building blocks of the sciences. I like to deconstruct it completely, bring it down to basics. That way it's neutral. Um, we don't have all these, we don't have to worry about all these gaps, you know, starting at the very complex. And it just gets, you know, people get to be really comfortable with the building blocks. Um, like, for example, in organic chemistry, we start with very basic building blocks. And to kind of really drive this point home, I want to give an example kind of with Legos, uh, especially because in Myochem, we were actually given like little, almost like Legos to build the molecules to understand uh, how they're bonding and things like that. And I thought that was really cool. Um, so we all generally know what Legos are, how they work. However, what you will notice is all Legos come in different sh shapes, sizes, colors, et cetera, et cetera. Just like you know, education, you have different topics and, and sort of things. But they do build on top of each other. 
And right off the get-go, if I asked you, can you build me a satellite with this pile of Legos? Like, well, not really. And sometimes that's what students expect. They expect on these tests to be already masters of it, and they get this negative feedback and then get demotivated. But what I'm here to say is like, no, well, let's just start at the very basics and let's build up from that. So if I ask you, build me a car from these piles, your first car you build may look something like this. You know, it's not the coolest looking car, it's not the sportiest looking car, but you still built it nonetheless. Um, as you get more comfortable with the Legos, you may start to see how they may interact differently. They can, you can build different components, maybe start getting a little bit more creative with it. For example, if you take that front bumper piece, put it in the back, put it an angle, it might be a spoiler. And then you start to develop cars like this. You have a cooler car, you know, may have more function to it, but you've been building with the same basic blocks. And then eventually with enough time and practice with these things, you may start to become a master in your domain, and that's when we start to see works like this. That's a McLaren, like, fully built thing. But again, sometimes some of the struggles I see in students is they want to be, they think the expectation is this, when it shouldn't be. We shouldn't be seeing things like, I need to do this, that's impossible. How am I going to do OCHEM? That's crazy. Um, so to begin with my students, we have to identify, first of all, to identify those Lego blocks, right? These, and they're called the threshold concepts. Um, and that's kind of a process called, uh, I'm really new to this process, but this is really cool. Uh, it's called Decoding the Discipline. And I actually recommend this website because uh, one of the steps, uh, it ultimately leads in this sharing step, where when you've decoded your own discipline, you actually share it online. You say, these are the concepts that are causing a lot of issues in my science. Uh, so I'm just going to briefly touch up on the first ones because those are the most related to my talk. The first one is defining the bottleneck. So what are your Legos of your class? You need to define those. And those are things that are widely shared online uh, in this process. Once you've identified them, you have to uncover the mental task. And this is a really hard um, thing to do as a teacher because a lot of these Legos have become so second nature to us that they're essentially invisible to the teacher. And some of, the, some of my students, at least, when I ask them, what do you think of the professor? They go, oh my god, they're just so incredibly smart. Like, they're just so smart, they, I can't understand anything because I'm too stupid. And I take a step back, like, why do you think you're so stupid? Why are you setting yourself to think that you should already be a master? Um, so one of, the, one of the issues that I've kind of noticed is oftentimes we kind of overlook these Lego blocks. Um, sometimes it could be due to assuming, like, oh, you're in college, you should know it by now. And that also, in turn, is a threat I've seen in my students. They think like because they should know it by now, they don't ask the questions. Therefore, you never identify those threshold concepts. Uh, so to kind of identify these things, to get at the heart of my talk here, these are the kind of the things I've done. And I've also asked for feedback from students, kind of asking them, like, well, what was it about um, when I, because I had a guest lecture TA a couple, or guest lecture um, for a class I TA'd, and they, and some of my review comments are saying, I wish you would have taught the entire course. I'm like, well, what was it about my slides? What, what was it that you liked so much? And first of all, uh, my students were saying that this kind of setting up of an environment where you say everyone has their gaps allows them to ask these questions. They don't feel embarrassed anymore. They actually start asking. And, and sometimes you're like, oh, did I just shoot myself as, in the foot as a grad student? Because then you get this flood of questions. And I'm always really happy to address it which is something they, they have also commented is that as the TA or as the teacher, um, you need to show interest in them as well. Uh, another thing that I've always found, um, and I can remember just one student coming to me, asking me, she was very kind of scared for the course, is uh, behavioral neuroscience. And she was saying, hey, like, I haven't really taken bio courses, and I don't know how I'm going to, I don't know if I'll do well in this course. I don't think I'm smart enough. Like, well, what makes you think that? Like, this isn't a question of your intelligence. All it really boils down to is using your Lego blocks over and over again, get really comfortable with it, and you'll see that you can build magnificent things. So I just like to remind people intelligence isn't really a factor. It's time and practice. Um, and that message is something I like to kind of give to all students. It's you're going to face struggles in college, but everyone does. And this message is really powerful. There's been studies done where they showed um, in, in at-risk uh, undergrad students, they sent to half of them, there's like a nice sample size of fresh, incoming freshmen, they sent to half of them. They had like this little small message saying, hey, you might encounter problems in college. However, everyone encounters problems. You know, it's not just a you thing. It's not just your group's identity thing, but like everyone comes across problems. And what they found is that those students that received the message actually started going to, they went to office hours more, they used the re university resources more. 
they stayed in college longer, um, and the motivation was sustained longer just by a simple message such as that. So this is kind of removing the stigma. Like maybe I'm not smart enough. It's like you're saying, well, everyone struggles with this. It's not just a you thing. Uh, and I see that kind of help students out and kind of get more motivated to be playing with their Legos over and over again until they're becoming masters. Um, on the teacher side, some of the feedback I've gotten is they say, you know, you're really enthusiastic. You have high energy. You actually show passion. That makes the class funner, or more fun. Um, you're very approachable. And there I was like, well, how do you get to be approachable? They were saying um, humble. That was one of the, like, the major ones I got back from them. They're like, you're just like one of those people that like, can admit faults in themselves. And that's like, really relatable. Um, so just to quickly wrap up uh, from all my experiences, I just want to leave this message of instead of you know, continuing this joke that's actually kind of, I just really like OCHEM a lot. But I, I, <laughs> I don't like this joke anymore. I want to switch to using this type of joke and really shifting our focus to the I'm trying. <laughs> I wanted to shift my focus to I'm trying, because that's what it's really about. It's just try. Don't worry about you know, OCHEM's label of being impossible. Just try, right? The master has failed more times than the beginner has even tried. So with that, I'd like to thank uh, UCSB, Tails, um, some of the students I worked with, and some of my mentors. Thanks. We do have time for a question, if anyone has any. I certainly like, if you can go back to the slide really quickly, the decoding the disciplines slide. If, I mean, so how, how in a general sense do you use this? I mean, maybe you can just explain it again and, or rephrase it. Right. I'm so um, this one, so I'm, I'm also kind of new to this wheel. Uh, and I'm actually like new word to TAing. I'm just finishing up my second year. Um, but what I found is basically I like to just kind of prod them a little bit, especially in, in class like neuroscience and things. We start off saying, uh, like, here's a cell and things like that. And the assumption is that um, like mechanisms in the cell, such as diffusion, should already be known. So I, since I already know that about biology, this is the seventh part of sharing. You can you know, see what, if you're new to a course, you can see what has already been shared, maybe the, the commonalities, the common struggles that students are having. Since I know diffusion is a very important concept to cell function, I usually start off by asking, like, can you briefly just uh, give me an example of what diffusion is? Or um, I, and if they feel uncomfortable, if I'm seeing they're a little uncomfortable, I actually give them a real world example. I find those are best because biology, the nature of it tends to be very like memorize, 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 and repeat, but don't, you don't really understand. And so I like to always relate things to kind of like the human body because we all have one. So it's really easy to grasp. So I use uh, examples using like real things that they can see. Um, there's also sections of the chapter where it's like, Muscle movement. So I tell them, like, move your muscles, see how it feels, right? Um, things like that. Uh, the other um, questions I ask, like, what are barriers you may, you feel like you may face in the course? And that's when the students have said, like, well, I've never taken bio, and this is my, um, like, they have these misconceptions of what it may be, and that's where I can help them kind of address, like, no, OCHEM isn't, like, putting things in beakers and exploding, and you don't know why, and then you fail. Like, in reality, it's this. All right, thank you very much. Uh, let's again, round of applause for Diego and Lauren.